one more. If everybody would just stand and uh, shake hands and wave to each other while you're still comfortable doing it. And uh, we'll do uh, until the storm passes by. Yeah. Thank you. songs just thinking about I know when I start talking about that not this one but the one before that I'll forget what I was going to say about this one so I'm going to talk about this one first but aren't you glad that the Lord will hold us fast Amen. until the storms pass by he does he will 
He has, right? He is. And yes. think back. It is so good to think back when God saved us. Where were you at? What was going on? Some of you were young. Some of you were older. Um, yesterday, and Ellie reminded me during that, during that song, yesterday was 10 years ago that the Lord saved Ellie. Uh, driving in to school, I looked back. She was just uh, uh, weeping, and she had been um, going through the Pilgrim's Progress, and God saved her. That's when we read that read that book or watched the, the, the little videos and stuff. And um, hey, man, praise the Lord that we're in Christ. We're not what we once were, right? We're not a finished product yet, but God has saved us. And he is saving us. He is changing us and making us into who he wants us to be. Amen? And that is good. And because we're in Christ, no matter what comes in this life, man, we're going to be all right. Amen. We're going to be all right in Jesus. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Now, I am so glad I listened to the good Lord on this one. We only got three verses this morning. <laughs> Going to a men's retreat that you're not speaking at as a pastor is a dangerous thing for a congregation the following Sunday. <laughs> because you, you, you have so much going through your heart, your mind of what the Lord was dealing with you on and you want people to know. Uh, how many of you know have experienced that as you learn something about the Lord, you learn something through his word? Or maybe it's not his word, maybe it's a, a, a vacation or maybe it's something you've experienced um, that was just really good. You can't help but want to tell people about it, right? Amen. And so I wanted, I, I thought about that before I went. I've been to these men's conferences before at Snowbird, and they're so good. And just let me take a few minutes to encourage you next time, man, to go with us, man. Um, I, we will organize things so we won't have to come back, um, maybe have someone fill in that morning so we can. I hate that we're missing the morning session this morning, but. It was such a blessed time, not just to sit under teaching, but the fellowship. You know, I learned things about Robert Jones that, you know, I, I never knew. Um, and I'm going to keep that between me because I feel like um, he might do something um, <laughs> later to get back at me. So I've learned that about him. Yeah. So, but all joking aside, it's not a joke. I mean, I enjoyed the fellowship of getting to know these guys a lot more than the, the nine that went with us and, um, good time together and they learned a lot about me uh we 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 had a time one night about 11 45 um we were in deep discussion and i gotta be honest i was about i was real sleepy and i made a comment that we were talking about david in psalm 51 mm -hmm. as he repents you know and his sin with bathsheba and i said a great profound theological statement and i want to share it with you that if you're not where you should be, you're where you shouldn't be. Amen. That's deep. That's good. Keaton did then, to the burst of laughter of most of the men there around the table, that was profound, he said. <laughs> and then they, they went on to rib me the rest of the weekend with the, that deep truth I laid on them there. I blame it on that I was tired. And, you know, anyway. <laughs> Man, a great time. Um, so thank you. I hope we can all go as men again and then have things here as men as well. I'm looking forward to, I've been talking about maybe doing a, having a fish fry at some point. We'll crop and get to eat and we'll clean them up and have some time and encourage men and ladies as well. We all need encouragement. We need time to step away and be encouraged. Um, I do uh, did get word that our brother Floyd, uh, Mr. Bobby McKinnon is out in the parking lot. Floyd, we love you. We're praying for you and your family and Miss Veronica is here as well. And just all those that are uh, dealing with loss. Miss Sharon, see you there in the back praying for you. Um, uh, but I hope this morning this is this is an encouraging message to you. It is an encouragement to it has been an encouragement to me uh, preparing uh, this week and even last week looking ahead into this and then deciding you know what I'm just going to hit these three verses because I won't be able to get out of here. But one of the things that we need in life is confidence. Um, our confidence 
is we put our confidence in so many different things and so many times we get let down. And really our confidence and our joy are interconnected. Uh, when, we are, when we have confidence in whatever we're doing, whether it's at work, um, you know, whether it's in sports for some of our students, when you know, let's say, a, 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 a basketball player, if you're playing you know, football seasons right now, if you're in football and, and you know the play, you know how to execute it as a team, you can have confidence that they go out there and execute it with speed and precision and, and, and joy. It's fun, man. When you don't know what you're doing in anything, it's not real joyous, right? Yeah, there's not a lot of happiness that comes from that. There's a difference in happiness and joy. Happiness is based off your circumstances. If things are going good, man, I'm smiling. If things ain't going good, I ain't smiling, right? We ain't happy inside. But joy is rooted uh, in confidence and joy is rooted in, in, in facts, as we'll see. Life is a fight for joy. In our fallen state, we have to fight for the joy that is ours in Christ. Amen. Because we're in this fallen bag of flesh, this sinful nature. This morning, we're going to see that Paul is given a strong warning to the church here at Philippi to beware of the false teachers that was going to come to him and that was already infiltrating Philippi. And we will see that our confidence as his followers, as Christ's followers, is found in him alone, in Christ alone. It's been said by Charles Swindoll, joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence today. And hey, listen, the king is reigning supreme. Amen. Amen. Our confidence is in Christ, no matter what we're facing, no matter what kind of situation you've gone through, you're in or you're going to go through, we can have confidence and we can have joy. The theme of Philippians is joy. He has mentioned this over and over and over again. Here at the beginning of this chapter, if there's any encouragement in Christ, chapter 2, verse 1, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy. Right? Complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. One purpose, one great affection as a people, church at Philippi, as a people, church at Bethlehem, is a devotion and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, for who he is, for what he's done and what he's going to do. He's going to bust the sky soon. And he's going to come back and get his people. And you say, well, man, it's been, it's been 2,000 years. That don't seem like real soon. It's going to seem like real soon yeah. when we're with him. Amen. Amen. This life is a vapor. One day we're here, one day we ain't. Amen. Right? Just hang on. Our joy is a flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence today. So a question I ask you this morning, is he in residence in your heart? Yes. Is he the supreme affection in your heart this morning? Let's read this text together. Three, chapter three, Philippians one to three. Hey, great pastoral word. Don't you just love this? Finally. He's in the middle of his letter. Now I will say this. Let me read it first. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Father, these next few moments by your Spirit, encourage your people. Turn our hearts affection and our mind's attention to you and you work by your spirit in us Lord not just right now in this service but through this week as we think about where our confidence lies and the joy that we have in Jesus you do this for your glory I pray in Jesus name amen amen life is a fight for joy 
Paul begins here with the word finally. Now, some scholars, just to do a little bit of background work with you, they think someone else has come in and written after this, after he says, finally rejoice in the Lord, because the transition moves from rejoicing to a warning. Rejoicing and being glad. Well, rejoice in the Lord. We should always rejoice, right? There's other passages in the scriptures. Rejoice in the Lord. Yes, I will say always rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Him. Well, what do we rejoice in? Well, Christ is on the throne, right? Amen. He's good. So he's talking to these brothers and sisters in Christ, and he exhorts them through a command to rejoice. And it's important to know, that's why it's important to know a little bit as we study and we look at God's word, the, the different tenses in the original language. This, this word rejoice is in the present tense. So you know what that means? It means to keep on rejoicing. The command he gives, so heading number one, rejoice in the Lord. The command is to keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing. Well, think about what all they're facing. Paul's in prison. They're facing uh, dissension from within. People are grumbling and complaining. They're not loving one another well, right? They're not preferring one another's needs. They're worrying about their own preferences and what they like. Do we struggle with that? Let's be honest. Yeah, man, we do. We do. So what do we have to do? We have to humble ourselves, and that's what he tells them to do. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, and he's telling them to rejoice in the Lord. Keep on rejoicing through this. I love what one guy says, David Paulson. He says, some people say, I can't rejoice because I don't have no command of my feelings. How can I turn on feelings of joy like that. I can't. He says, oh, but you can. Provided there's a good reason for doing so. True emotionalism, he says, is turning your feelings on when there is no foundation for those feelings or no facts behind it. Yes. Listen, we can turn on emotionalism when there's no, that's what emotionalism is. We have to be careful of that. I don't ever want to lead into that, to lead a, because uh, people do that, right? We can turn the lights down and get some fog machine up here and, you know, play some real sappy music and talk to you about all kinds of stuff and get you all emotional. Well, there's no fact to that. There's no truth to that. It's not grounded in any truth. Paulson says, but if the facts are there on which, if, but if the facts are there on which you can rejoice, then you ought to rejoice. It becomes not good advice, but a command. Amen. And his command to rejoice, to keep on rejoicing, is based on some facts. Yeah. Yes. We need to be reminded of those facts daily. Yeah. That's why I've tried to share, and you've heard it said of others, I'm sure, you preach the gospel to yourself each day. Yeah. Listen, you are not defined by your sin anymore. You're defined by the righteousness of Christ. Amen. You're not defined by your past mistakes. Your present mistakes or the mistakes you're going to make. The sin you're going to commit in the future. Not that we say, well, God's going to cover everything. I'll just do what I want to you know, do. I'll just sin that grace may abound. Paul said, may it never be, right? No. No, it's based on what God has done. So a couple things I wrote down. Number one, what are some facts that we trust in? Understand that the Lord is in control. He is sovereign and he is supreme and he is reigning over all things. Amen. As Abraham Piper said that we quoted in Sunday school, there is not one square or an inch on planet earth in which the risen Christ does not say mine and I rule it. And we are hidden in his son and therefore we are safe and secure. No matter Amen. what happens in life or death, I am secure. That's why Paul would say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You cut my head off and we'll be with Jesus. Yes. If you don't, and he did, he had his head cut off and his blood was spilled out as we were exhorted and taught this weekend. His life, his life was an offering to the Lord. And our lives should be an offering to the Lord. We should understand that the Lord is in control. We should Remind, listen, remind yourself of your standing with the Lord because of the work of Christ. Amen. Your salvation is not based on what you have done, but what Christ has done. Yes. Yes, your, the keeping of your salvation is not based on what you do and how you perform, but what he has done. Yes. 
Yes. Now, do we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Absolutely, for it is God who works in us to work it out. Right? We can't be passive and man be pan be, you know, I, I just want to do whatever, you know. No. We have to be active and vigilant in crucifying the flesh, making war on our sin, our our preferences, the things that we like, you know. Take those in to the Lord. Take our thought life to the Lord. We remind ourselves that our security in Christ is based on the finished work of Christ. Amen. His resurrection and his ascension, right? All that he did at the cross. Remember that the Lord will sustain you through every circumstance and trial that you will ever face or that you have ever faced. Think a minute and just step back and look back at your life. And I want you to recognize something. God has been sustaining you. Maybe even as an unbeliever, he was using those things to draw you to himself. All those failures, all your fears. God is at work in that. That is good. Amen. We need to remember that. We need to remember that the Lord will provide the spiritual strength we need for peace and unity in the church, as well as dealing with the pressure of the world and false teaching. That's what he's going to be saying here. And listen, the heat is getting turned up. Yes. And there will be no place for weak Christians. Weak Christians will fall by the wayside here. So what are you saying? Is that everybody needs to be super mature? Yeah. But we need to recognize this. Some of us ain't. And so what do we need? We need to prefer one another. And those that are younger in the faith, I'm not just talking about younger in age. There's some older people that may be immature in faith, right? That we're there together, linked up. Amen. And we look out for one another. We care for one another, right? We don't say, well, I'm more, you know, well, more mature than you. Good luck over there with that situation. No, we, we come in. We walk in. We walk with them. Right? That's what Jesus did. That's what we should do. So we got to remember that. We need to remember as we face the pressure of the world and it's getting heated up to say marriage is between a man and a woman, to call sin, sin. There's going to come a day, man. It's coming real quick. But that is not popular. That's not super hard where we're at right now, protected here in the South. But that is changing. Oh, oh, so quickly, y'all. So you can rejoice in the Lord. We can rejoice in the Lord because it depends on facts and getting the facts right. We need to know who Jesus is and what he did. We need to know what we believe about this word. It is sufficient for everything we need in life and godliness to tell us about God, to tell us about ourselves. Tell us about the world outside of us. Depend upon the word. Are you trusting in the word? This is where the facts are. This is, contrary to the world, absolute truth. Amen. Contrary to the colleges and universities and what they're teaching. This is truth. This is absolute. You can stake your life upon it. Amen. Right? Amen. Uh, Brody was... Sharing with us, I thought about that for the message. It was like, you know, I think it was Brody or, or maybe Spencer, one of the, ses one of the sessions. Uh, you know, the, the scriptures, the, the first coming of Jesus, think how long it took for him to come. Think how long the, the Israelites were in Egypt and cried out and cried out. Think about the 400 years of silence and then, bam, here comes the Son of God yeah. as a baby born in a manger. Right? But it wasn't that. It was Herod and them. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill that promised one that would crush the head of the serpent. The one that would then come and disrupt all of their gain, all of their money, all of their system. Right? Jesus comes in the fullness of time. And he lives a life that we couldn't live. And he dies the death we deserve. Amen. And he rose again and defeated it all. Praise the Lord for that. Understand God's sovereign. Remind yourself of your standing in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his word. Remember that the Lord will sustain you by his spirit, independence upon his word through every circumstance that you've ever faced and that you will face. And remember the Lord will provide spiritual strength and the peace we need to face every situation at every stage of life. Whether you're a little kid, teenager, adult, 
older adult, whatever stage of life, God is there. His spirit is enabling you. So we rejoice because of those facts. And this is good as we face times of death. We face, we face times of suffering, separation, disappointment, right? Discouragement. That, what, that is what comes in this life. So he says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Keep on rejoicing. So to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So he transitions now, right? Normally you hear family from a preacher. You're like, man, he's about to wind it up. We get lunch, right? Not here. He'll pick up finally again in chapter four, verse one. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for my joy and crown. He picks up there in chapter four and he finishes up. But this, this command is followed by an admonition in verse two. He's admonishing them, and it takes the form of three other commands, three straight commands, all using uh, the, the verb here to beware, or the ESV really translates it very literally, and I think the New American Standard does, look out, beware, beware, beware. Now, when I was a young guy, he just think, man, beware of dogs. There it is right there. He's a dog fan. He's a Georgia fan, but that is not what this text is saying. Got nothing to do with football. I always joke about that. This is no joking matter here because what's at stake is there are those that we're, we're going to see here. The Judaizers are trying to, to trip them up. Watch out. Watch out. Look out. And each of these verbs are followed by a description of false teachers, dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. That sounds terrible. And it is. And Paul uses this to highlight and to understand who these heretics are and the false teaching that is there. So before we get into the details of that, let's understand who they are. Most scholars understand that, that this is to assess who these false teachers are, are the Judaizers. They're, they belong to a, a Jewish Christ follower movement. They wanted to make all Christians, all Gentile believers, followers, and those who would practice Judaism. That they would have to not only trust Christ, but also keep the law. So it was Jesus plus this. Well, it's Jesus plus nothing, right? Amen. We can't keep the law. Jesus kept the law. These guys were totally off. And they were placing demands upon people that the gospel doesn't. So this movement began in a reaction to the gospel. The gospel that was proclaimed first by Peter after the conversion of Cornelius in Acts 11. And then by Paul. And at first, almost everyone agreed with Peter's defense. You can read that for yourself in Acts 11, 4 through 17. His defense of the coming of the Spirit upon all of those um, God-fearing uh, Gentiles. Cornelius recognizing that even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. But very quickly, what happened is false teaching came in. They started to move from that. They began to dispute that. Most of them were former Pharisees and all of them um, completely committed to the ongoing necessity of the law, of the, uh, uh, what they would say is the Torah, the instruction, the law that the, the opinion took, understanding the, the law and keeping the law as a way of being made right with God. So not just for Jewish converts to Christianity, but for Christian I mean, for Gentile Christians, they had to trust Christ and do this. Now, this term Judaizers was not used by them in the first century uh, or, or in this time with Paul. It would come uh, later on, um, but not during Paul's time. So the Judaizers would send people to these Gentile churches that Paul and Barnabas had established on their first missionary journey. And they but they were opposed to by Paul in a letter. The church at Galatia flipped back just a couple of books there to Galatians chapter 1. And listen to what Paul says. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 6, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to, look what he says, a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one 
we preach to you, let him be an accursed, an anathema is what that means. An accursed thing, as we have said before. So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And Paul follows that up with, for am I seeking the approval of man or of God? If he was seeking the approval of these Pharisees, these elite Pharisees, if he was under pressure of that, or is he seeking to, to be approved by God? He's seeking the approval of God. Am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ, a slave of Jesus. So boiling all of that down, these Judaizers were saying, if you're a Christian, you need to do this. It's not by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. It's by works. You can do something. You can be good enough. You can keep the law and make yourself right with the Lord. And that is just not true. So he writes this to the church of Galatia. Um, they are then defeated at the council in Jerusalem. This is recorded for you in Acts 15, right? And they continue to reject that decision. They would travel around to these Gentile churches. And this is what is coming to church of Philippi. So Paul says, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it's safe for you. And listen, this is the same thing. We've been defending this. Listen, the gospel is, is the fact, right? It's truth. Nothing can be added to or taken away from, right? Keeping the law is not going to do it. So, he tells them to rejoice and he tells them here in verse 2 to recognize the deceivers. Point number 2, recognize the deception. There's all kind of deception today about what the gospel is. That's why we need to be able to, to know the gospel and be able to articulate the gospel well, right? But we need to recognize the deceiver. So he says, take heed of this warning. Paul responds here in Philippians in the way that he did similarly there in, uh, in Galatia. With these these three phrases that are all drawn from these Jewish metaphors of dogs. How many of you in here got dog lovers? Any dog lovers in here? Now don't be ashamed, man. Ain't nothing wrong with liking a dog. Well, it says beware of the dogs here. Look, look at you know. These aren't the same type of dogs that we got now. And I'll be honest, man. Dogs today live a whole lot better than dogs here in the first century. These things are scavengers, run around. They're wild dogs, and they would. It'd be like that. They'd be like that dog in the neighborhood, you know, that was never on the leash, and you knew it would gnaw your leg off, right? If you went by there, um, I tell you a funny story. I was, I was. Uh, there was a point in time when I was training for a marathon in Canada, because we were moving back here to run with a buddy. He was turning fifty. He wanted to run a marathon. He's like, "Man, run with me." I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to run the marathon. I get, I'm short. I'm well fed. <laughs> happy in that but I wanted to support my brother so I started training well I got down this road and, and where we lived out in the country was just dairy farms well there was a German shepherd two of them in this yard that I run by I didn't know I never saw them before and I never ran back that way again but I come running by and I had my little airpods in it was really cold I was all bundled up and all of a sudden I look out the side of my uh, to my right side, running down this road, and here comes these two German shepherds, and I mean, they are bearing down on me. Now, I've already run like four or five miles, so guess what I ain't got? I ain't got no getaway speed. I ain't got no car. I ain't got no weapon. I just got all 200 and something pounds of meat, you know? And I'm like, I am about to get ate up. But they got, I mean, I went over to the other side of the road, and they come, and they stop right at the driveway. They have one of those electric fence things, collars, which I didn't see. And I was like, you know, I went from, you know, running a heartbeat, and it was like Rocky. I was like, yes! <laughs> yes, Lord. Thank you. Those dogs would have hurt me. And this time, dogs were unclean animals, and they were viewed very negatively. And this is how Jewish people would refer to Gentiles as dogs. Dogs, they were a nuisance. They were a dangerous nuisance. And so dogs then were particularly noted for eating garbage. The Jews used dogs to, to describe Gentiles who failed to follow the Jewish dietary laws and, and thereby unclean. 
So they didn't follow the law, those dietary laws that were there. So they were unclean, filthy dogs. Paul turns this metaphor on its head. And he says that these Jewish Christians were truly impure dogs who stood outside the code of God themselves. Watch out. Beware. Look out for the dogs. These are actually the dogs. They're the ones who think they're Christians, but they're outside of the covenant because they're trusting in their good works. And listen, if you're trusting in your good works this morning, you are outside of a relationship with God. Nothing can save you but the righteousness of Christ. Amen. The same reversal he uses with the, this term evildoers. Look out for, beware of, watch out for the evildoers. The Jewish people and the Gentiles rejected God and his Torah. So were those who do evil. They thought that the Gentiles were evildoers. The book of Psalms picks this all up as you read through just to share a couple with you. Uh, Psalm 6, 8, depart from me, all you workers of evil. Psalm 14, 4, have they no, uh, have they no knowledge, all evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord, right? He's writing to Hebrew believers. Psalm 94, 4, they pour out their arrogant words as the evildoers boast, right? So Paul's point here is that the true evil no longer consists of failing to keep the law, but rather involved doing that which undermined the gospel of Christ. And this is the description that, that now they embodied as false teachers. So Paul was turning the importance of works right back against them. He's using it against them now. Do you understand why he was beaten so much? Understand why he was wanted to be killed and why he would eventually be beheaded? Because of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. Listen, you might not be accepted in this world. Matter of fact, as you live for Jesus, you won't be. But guess what? You're in good company. Because we're aligning ourselves with the Savior. Now this is not this does not mean we need to go out and be idiots and speak arrogantly to, arrogantly to people. No, it's not a license to be a fool. We should be humble, but we should stand for truth. We should have some backbone and courage about us as men and women of the Lord and stand for truth. And Paul Wood tempted to talk about what we talked about this weekend at Men's Conference, but I'm not. Paul did that. Life was poured out for the Lord. So these Judaizers had a mission that was direct, directly opposite of Paul's. For they went forth spreading the gospel of the law observance to do and observe the law, not the gospel of Christ and the cross. So their, their position, their stance was against and constituted true heresy. They were replacing the cross with the law. They were going back, right? And then he picks up there what he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This is the imagery of circumcision. This was the sign that you were a member of the Jewish family in the sign of, of, the, of God's covenant in the Old Testament. And this, this Greek word for circumcision is a word for mutilation. The cutting of the foreskin. Since the Judaizers had replaced the cross with circumcision as a means of salvation, they had, in Paul's view, this is good, changed the rite of circumcision into an act of mutilation. They were mutilating the gospel is what they were doing. Yeah. They were distorting the gospel, and they were damning people to hell because they were preaching a different gospel. Right? That's why Paul would say in Galatia that these people should be accursed. Right? For the covenant ceremony actually cut off people from salvation. So this is the most serious charge that Paul brings against these Judaizers. For the circumcision is at the heart. It's at the heart of, of Judaism. Of being a Jew. It encompassed the whole idea of observing the law and covenant faithfulness. So in effect, what Paul is saying here is those who promoted circumcision rejected the new covenant established by Christ at the cross. And that was in his blood. They were trying to return people to the old covenant 
And they ended up with no covenant at all. Because the old covenant is done away with. The new covenant now is established. Where do we see this visibly demonstrated for us in the divine drama that we celebrate in the church? It's the Lord's Supper. The new covenant that is in his blood that we partake in. Right? So he's trying, they're trying to return to the old covenant. They have no covenant. Paul insisted we're entirely cut off from God and from his grace and mercy in Christ. So lastly, verse 3, we need to remember who we are. We need to rejoice in the Lord, continue to rejoice. We need to recognize those that are deceiving us with false gospels and the false teaching that is rampant in our culture that was rampant here. And we need to remember who we are. Look at what he says. For we are the circumcision. What he's saying is we are the true circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Yes. We're the true circumcision. We're the real people of God. Not y'all. Because we follow Christ, Christ alone. The people of Israel could no longer be called the circumcision for they had rejected who? Jesus. They rejected the Messiah. They rejected his work, his cross work. And as a result, they no longer had the spirit of God. They no longer experienced the presence of God any longer. Romans uh, 2.29 picks this up. A person is a Jew who is inwardly and circumcision is the circumcision of the heart yeah. by the spirit, not by written code. That's what Paul's saying. It's a matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, you see. That's what he's saying. You need new hearts. It's not a, it's not a, a, a physical sign anymore in the new covenant. It's a new heart that now can beat for the Lord and loves him and obeys him. It's evidence through obedience to his commands and what he says in his son, Jesus. It's the heart, not external experience, uh, appearance. That's what determines who the true Israel is, you see. And that now consists entirely of Christ's followers, Jews and Gentiles. This is what Paul explains to in Ephesians. There are two groups. You don't have like Israel over in Israel and then Christ's followers. We are now one in Christ, all those who believe upon Jesus. Amen. Now, there are Jews that are around the world that God's going to do something with later on. Yeah, I believe so. That's what Paul explains in Romans 9. But it's going to come through the cross. That's the only way, right? God's going to open their eyes by the Spirit. We know their hearts have been hardened for, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. God is bringing in the nations. He's bringing in the nations through the preaching of the gospel. That's what we're a part of. At some point, He's going to bring more Jews to faith through the preaching of the gospel. Amen. But we are one. This is what He says. Uh, Ephesians, I got to hurry. Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let me back up. Verse 12, remember, remember that you were at, at that time separated from Christ. He's talking to Gentile believers, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise. Covenants. What, what covenants are you talking about? I'm talking about a Mosaic covenant, right? So Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, even though we were included in that and they didn't realize it. Yeah. The Mosaic Covenant, the law, right? The Davidic Covenant, pointing in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, looking to the New Covenant. Gentiles, we were strangers of that, Paul is telling these, yes. these believers at Ephesus. You, you, were, you were outside of that. You were strangers. You were alienated, matter of fact, from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope and without God in the world. This is who we would have been without the work of Christ. Amen. This is what... This is who we were. But now, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. We have been brought near to God. How? By the blood of Christ. Amen. Through his sacrificial life and death, his blood shed and poured out. He's brought us near. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. Who is this now? This is Jew and Gentile yes. and has broken down in his flesh, in Jesus's flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself. Here it is. One new 
man in the place of the two, in the place of the Jew and the Gentile. So making peace, he might reconcile us both to God in one body. How? Through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Amen. We are one in Jesus, a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. God, by the gospel, by the power of the spirit, he is drawing in together. One new man, one new Israel, one new people who reflect what it's like to be in a relationship with the creator Amen. who will then dwell with him for eternity. And it starts now. It starts now where we're here now. Eternal life begins now. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ, the Lord. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? You need to remember these things. You need to remember who you are. We have been given a, a new heart. He will go on. Jews and Gentiles alike who follow Christ are joint members of God's family. We have an inheritance. We've been adopted. We've been given his name. And we are, we do not trust in our pedigree or physical circumcision as the covenant sign, but a heart belief by the way of the cross. So Paul follows this up. Paul follows this up with three clauses here that define new Israel, his new people, the people of the new covenant. These three, we serve by the spirit, by, by, we serve God by his spirit. We boast in Christ Jesus, right? And we put no confidence in the flesh. We serve God by the spirit real quickly. This has a double meaning here of serve and worship. And while some versions translate it worship, the Septuagint, which is the old Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses it for the Levitical service in the temple. So service is probably better here, but it does have the, it does have the idea of worship. And this is good. Stick with me. Such service in the temple included worship in spirit and in truth. Where do we hear that at? The woman at the well, right? John 4, 23 and 24. Paul had both concepts in view. He had both of this idea of worship and service. Where do we see this at, right? We see this in, we see this in Romans 12. Yes. Judaizers were doing this in a fleshly way without the, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But only coming to God by faith in Christ can you receive the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has the Spirit. And then be sealed by the Spirit. So, listen to Romans 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service or your spiritual worship. It's both. You see that? That's what he's after. Second, we boast in Christ. He's building on chapter 1, verse 26. I'm in Ephesians. I was like, my word, there's not even 26 verses. Here it is. Verse 26. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And then verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I'm not running vain or laboring in vain. Holding fast to Christ. Paul's point is that true boasting is not in self, but true boasting is Christ-centered boasting. Yes. We boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Judaizers were entirely fleshly. Their pride, their law observance, rather than in Christ. He picked this up in 1 Corinthians, also 2 Corinthians, where Paul quotes Jeremiah 9, 24, where he says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen, brothers and sisters, how were you saved? How were you saved? We think back as we, we sang that. I shared me reminding of your salvation. Think back, how were you saved then? Did you save yourself? Did you muster up enough courage and do enough good deeds to get yourself right and go, yeah, here I am, Lord? No, sir, you didn't. Amen. Were you saved by works or by grace? You saved by works or by grace through faith in Jesus, based on the facts of Jesus is where our salvation is found. Amen. So thirdly, he says, we put no confidence in the flesh. That includes circumcision. That does not bring us into covenant, right? What they were trying to place upon the Gentiles. This is the negative side of boasting in Christ. And no flesh but Christ's confidence in boasting. This is exactly how Paul defines salvation in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We know these verses, right? Yeah. But listen to them again. 
By grace, not by works. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. You didn't save yourself. God came to you by the Holy Spirit, and He quickened your heart, and He opened your blinded eyes to see the light of the gospel. Amen. To see you were a sinner, and He is a great God and a mighty Savior. And you repented as you exercised faith in what He did. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Have you received this gift this morning? Whether you're here or outside or on the interweb. That was supposed to be a joke. Internet. <laughs> this is not a result of work so that no one may boast. We can't do it. Because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God, here it is again, prepared beforehand. That we should walk in him. He knows the end from the beginning. Oh, he knows you well. And he has saved you. He set his affection upon you. We boast in him. Not what we do or what we don't do. We boast in who he is and what he has done. They, the Judaizer had an opposite understanding of that. Of, 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 under, of salvation. It was all works based. Not of grace. There's a double meaning here for flesh. It's referring first to the fleshly right of circumcision. And secondly... Secondly, the fleshly descent of the covenant centering on the national identity and the, the, the heritage, the ancestral heritage. That's what they focused on, the Judaizers. But listen, a right relationship with God is spiritual and of the spirit centering in the atoning work and sacrifice of Christ yes. and not in some ancestry, not in being born into it. You're not born a Christian. I don't care how good your family has been. To the church, through the years, it can't save you. Church attendance can't save you. Giving can't save you. Not cussing, drinking, any of that can't save you. Amen. Only Christ can save you. The flesh always trusts in, per in its performance, but the spirit gives confidence in Christ's performance. I love that. Yes, brother. The flesh, our flesh trusts in how we perform. Listen. God is not looking for behavior modification in how we perform. That's right. he's, he's looking for hearts that are bent to Him, Amen. that are humbled to Him, that boast in Him. And the Holy Spirit gives confidence in Christ's performance. I close with this from Grant Osborne as he summarizes this passage. He's with the Lord Jesus now, incredible New Testament scholar. He said the message of Philippians 3, 1 to 3 is clear. Any attempt to place our confidence in our earthly relationships or human achievements is doomed to fail. All non-Christian religions, including that of the Judaizers here, are in the end nothing more than pride-filled attempts to earn our own salvation by our works. Nothing can make you a better man except the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Nothing can make you a better woman except the gospel of Jesus. Obedience and humility to Him Osborne would go on and say, we can become part of the new Israel, the true people of God, only when our boasting is centered in Christ and our action involves faith in him and his work on the cross. The unmerited grace of God is the basis of our salvation. We can purchase nothing. Rather, we have been purchased by Christ for God. Amen. He's purchased you. Your body is not your own anymore, Paul would say. Therefore, glorify him in your body. Amen. Yes. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your grace. Do your work by your spirit for your glory. May our confidence rest in the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of Christ. Our confidence is Christ alone. May that ring true for us as we go through these days until we see you face to face. And as we have confidence, may your joy flow through us in our relationships one with another, in our families, in our communities, in our jobs. Lord, we are here purposely to know you, enjoy you, and make much of you. So Father, do your work and continue to, to run those rebars of your confidence deep into our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 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 <coughs> You want to get a 
song of invitation. And the invitation is this. Where's your confidence? Where's your joy? If it's based on, remember the difference in happiness and in joy, right? If it's based on circumstances, we're not always going to be happy. But joy is based on facts, right? Amen. Our confidence in Christ, focusing on the gospel, that will elevate our joy day by day as we think about that, as we preach the gospel to ourselves. So you can respond right where you're at and come to this altar. You can do it tomorrow morning as you're driving to work. You be sensitive to the Lord and His leading. Amen? invite you back this evening as we dive into uh, the book of Jonah and uh, I'm going to try to get through that first chapter and we're not going to hit every little detail but we're going to get bird's eye view maybe an introduction we'll see how far I get there but come on up Miss Kim she's going to give us a uh, share with us an opportunity